I'm really glad to be here with you guys. It's going to be super fun to spend the week hanging out, talking to each other, sharing. And I want you to know that I don't take this opportunity for granted. In the year 2000, I came to Chehi, and I was like a lot of these people. Not those people. Just these people. And um, it is amazing to, to think back on what I learned and how God challenged me through his word. And so I don't think that this time that we're spending together is just some sort of way to put a Christian stamp on an otherwise just musical camp. That everything we do here at Chehi, the goal is to love God, to realize and recognize his glory, his power, his presence, and to respond to that in the right way. And this is a big part of being able to do that. So for those of you who haven't met me, I know we got introduced last night, but my name is Kelly, and uh, this is going to be a time for us to be in God's Word. But I want to start out this morning uh, with a little exercise to wake us up, because it's, it's in the morning. You don't have to stand up, but it has a few steps. So first it goes like this. Okay, you ready? You point to your temples, and then you snap. All right, so let's get that together. Ready? Oh, yeah. All right, so that's step one. Then we plop our hands onto our chest left, right, like this. All right. I'm probably smashing this microphone, so sorry, people on the interwebs. Um, all right, so it goes like this. Ooh, that's nice. Let's do that one more time. Ooh, that's good. Okay, and then the last part goes like this. That's the easiest part. So now we gotta put it all together. Ready? Let's do it. Ooh, that's good. One more time. Okay, that's cool. So you guys seem awake. You seem dex dexterous. Um, Dexterous. moving. Dexterous? I don't know. I don't know what the word means. Yeah, it's, you can move your limbs and stuff, and your body is responsive. And that's good. Uh, if you have your Bibles, if, and you're a girl, you should open them up to Proverbs 3.11. And if you have a Bible and you're a boy, you should open it up to Hebrews 12.5. Twelve five. All right. So while you're looking those up, um, what I want you guys to know right off the bat is nothing that I share with you is significant because I say it. That everything that is communicated with you is only significant because it's in God's word. That God's word is powerful. God's word is true. God's word is right. And he is the one that we are meant to listen to. God cares about us. God is involved in our lives. And so everything that we do this week in chapel is meant to reflect what God speaks. And he is perfectly capable of speaking for himself. And we're so grateful that he does speak for himself every time we open up our Bibles and recognize and read what he has to say. So I'm going to be talking this week with you guys about how people change and how we can really become the people who God wants us to be, who he made us to be. And so the idea today is that you can really become who God says that you are. And uh, we're going to look at, at this a little bit, but I, I want to start just by saying you need to change. And I need to change. And some of you really need to change. No, I'm just kidding. We all need to change. And the reason for that is that God isn't done working in our lives, that he is making us like him. And that's a process that takes time. And he is continuing to do that over time. And we should be thankful for this. It doesn't always feel good. And it doesn't always go the way we think that it should. But God always accomplishes his purposes. And God does it in the best way because... He's God, and He's the best. So, just to get a little picture of this, let's start out by looking at these texts. So, if you're a girl person, would someone be willing to read Proverbs 3, 11, and 12? Whoa. Um, yes. Uh, wait, I... Shelly! Thanks for helping me. We had a long conversation, and apparently it didn't sink in. Would you read um, Proverbs 3, 11, and 12? Loud. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline, and do not resent his rebuke, because the Lord disciplines those he loves, as a, as a father to son he delights in. 
Thanks so much. That was great. And would a guy person be willing to? I'm going to go with, with you right here on the end. What, what's your name? Matthias. Matthias. That is an awesome name. Would you read uh, Hebrews 12, 5 through 6? Hebrews 12. Yes, he Hebrews 12. <clears throat> and have you forgotten the ex exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, or be wary when reproved by him. Reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chast chastises or whatever. Every son whom he received. Love it. That was great. I targeted for teenagers if you want me to. Sure, go for it. Okay. Indeed, you seem to have forgotten the proverb directed to you as children. My child, do not ignore the instruction that comes from the Lord, or lose heart when he steps in to correct you. For the Lord disciplines those he loves, and he corrects each one he takes as his own. Love it. So these verses you might have noticed are sort of similar. One is in the Old Testament, written by a, a king of Israel, Solomon, and one is in the New Testament. We don't actually know for sure who wrote the book of Hebrews, but it's uh, thousands of years later, and it's after Jesus had died and rose from the dead and established his church. And things had changed, but the truth hadn't changed that God disciplines his children, not because he's mean and he wants to cause them problems, but because he wants to grow them and show them what it looks like to live like him because he loves them. That God is accomplishing this change because he loves them. And the good news for us, at least part of it, is that the them is us. That when it talks about um, the Lord's discipline and the Lord disciplining those he loves, those he loves are all of his people. And if you're a Christian, I want to let you know that God loves you like you are. Uh, in his eyes, you are defined by the perfect righteousness of Jesus. And he has given you this awesome new identity, even our theme verse for the summer that the, the old is gone and the new has come and we are this whole new creation. And that has happened, but God isn't finished with us yet. He doesn't stop at salvation. He continues to work as time goes on. And he keeps transforming us and he's faithful to complete what he starts and he's making us more like him. And what he wants us to be more like is people who look like our father, and people who live like our brother. Now, it might be a little weird to talk about Jesus as our brother, but there are many places in the New Testament that talk about Jesus as the firstborn son who is bringing you know, many other sons to glory. And so in, in this sense, Jesus is, is our brother, our older example, the one we're following after. And some of you here at camp might even have an older sibling who's been here before. And um, did you have a question? Great question. So there's generally two ways that the Bible talks about when it uses the word son. And that's a really good question. Um, but it does mean all people, and it actually is more uh, inclusive than you might think girl people. There's a few times in the New Testament where specifically the writers don't say sons and daughters or brothers and sisters or men and women. They say sons and usually this happens when they're talking about a son who is going to receive an inheritance. Now things are different now but back in the day when a, when a father and a mother would die they would leave an inheritance to their kids but they wouldn't spread it all out. So I have three siblings. So it's me, my brother Sean, my sister Aaron, and my sister Jessica. They're not actually that size. It's like uh, Jessica, Aaron, me, Sean. And, um, and usually what would happen nowadays is it would get split up in a way that was sort of equal. And so you'd say, ah, oh, you know, my parents have $12, and so $3 for Sean, $3 for Kelly, $3 for Aaron, $3 for Jessica. But back in the day, the way that they would do it would be that only the firstborn son would really get much. So it would be like, Sean gets $10, he's the man, the firstborn son. Kelly gets $2 because he's a man, but not the firstborn son. And the girls, well, eh. And that seems sad, but when the Bible talks about us as being heirs of God's promise and calls us firstborn sons or sons, often it's saying that men or women, it doesn't matter, that God includes you as someone who will receive this inheritance of righteousness. And so it's saying, it doesn't matter if you're a boy, it doesn't matter if you're a girl, God loves you based on what Jesus has done, not based on uh, any other factor. Does that, that might have been over the top. Okay, cool. Um, 
But keeping it, keeping it going here, all that to say God wants to transform us and he wants us to make us like him. But what we want to talk about this week is how does that actually happen? And I think a lot of Christians sort of bang their head against the wall because they end up finding themselves doing things that they don't want to do and they think, oh man, I've been a Christian for a good long while. Why do I keep acting like I'm not? Or they think, uh, if I just work hard, I can really change myself, and God will be pleased with me, and he'll give me some bonus points. And bonus points are good. Some people call them brownie points. I don't know how, how God works, but brownies do sound good. Um, but the gospel is not like that. It says that Jesus has actually accomplished everything for us, that God himself left heaven and came to earth, lived a perfect life that none of us could live, and died a criminal's death on the cross that all of us deserve to die, rose from the dead, proving that anyone who believes in him, trusts in him, follows him, can live with him forever. <laughs> And this is all accomplished by what Jesus does, not by what we do. And that's what makes the good news good, because we're all pretty messed up. But then once we believe in Jesus, we might ask ourselves a question, why do I keep struggling to live like Jesus? Why don't I act like him? And I want to say this, you can't actually just work on your actions. You can't just try to change your will. That if you want to change, a lot of times you'll say, I'm just going to be better, I'm just going to be better, I'm just going to be better, and you'll find yourself not being any better. Have any of you ever experienced that? Um, and this might have applied to you sometimes even in music. Um, I've definitely experienced that in many ways, uh, where I try to improve myself, and it turns out I'm not self-improvable. Um, so something, though, can change us. The Bible says that we are called to live holy and godly lives. So how does that work? Well, our will, what we do, our actions, is controlled by something else. It's sort of like um, if you ever have seen a puppet. Uh, I'll go with a very basic kind, like a sock puppet, or you seen something like this. Um, and you're like, hello! You can't actually get the sock puppet to do anything on its own. Why is that? Sorry. It's not alive, so therefore it can't do anything on its own. Yeah, it can't do anything on its own. It's controlled by someone else, right? Like, I could say, meet my friend Donald. Hello, I am Donald. Um, we don't know why Donald talks like that, but excuse him, he's going through a tough time. Um, if, if Donald talks like that, and you say, wow, I really want Donald to change his voice. Hello, is not pleasant. So, ha Donald, we really need you to change. How much would you have to talk to Donald to get him to change how he talks? Nothing. What, what do you mean? Because he so he can't... So how would you actually change how Donald speaks? The way that you make him speak. Okay, so you would talk to... <laughs> yeah, you would talk to me. You would say, oh, you know, something controls Donald, and it's actually you, Kelly. And so Donald's voice is really annoying, and I would really like it if he spoke in a different way. And I'd be like, oh, cool, I can do that. And so I'd be like, what up, I'm Donald. And so, like, <laughs> he... Okay, I can't help that, but what it really comes down to is Donald is fully controlled by something else, and our actions are controlled by something else. Our will is controlled by something else, and that, that moves one step back to our hearts. Did you know that every person almost always does what they want to do? Almost always you do what you want to do. When you walked through the breakfast line this morning, why did you get what you got? Because you wanted it, or because you wanted it more than the other options available. Um, but you got what you got because you wanted it. You, you desired it, so you got it. Um, and when we do things, we generally, almost always, do what we want to do. And you might say, oh, I didn't really want to do a lot of things. I, I mowed my lawn, but I didn't want to do that. But um, when your dad said, you got to mow your lawn, did you mow your lawn? Oh, man. Um, 
Hopefully you did, and even if you didn't want to mow the lawn, you did maybe want to obey your dad. Or maybe, you know, you love your dad, you wanted to please your dad. Or maybe you were going to play a, you know, really fun game of badminton out there, and you needed a very nice lawn, so you wanted, whatever reason you mowed your lawn, underneath it, there's some reason why you wanted to do that. And you did it at some level because you wanted to. Why do you do your chores? So you won't be grounded. Do you want to be grounded? No. no. So when you do your chores, why are you doing them? Because you want to. Um, or you might just like being helpful if you're an altruistic, kind, loving, generous, pleasant, benevolent person. Um, but we, um, gen we don't always do that. But all that to say, we do what we want to do. And what we want to do controls what we do. Do. Um, I said do, do. Um, so... Anyway, so what, we do something because we want to do that thing. But have you ever wondered why you want to do the things you do? It's getting a little weird, right? Why do I, why do I care about the, like when I went down the breakfast line, why did I get granola? But why, why, what do I like about it? It's healthy. Yeah, I like it because it pretends to be healthy, so it makes me feel good about myself. I'm like, and it tastes good, and I can call my wife and be like, I ate a healthy breakfast. And she's going to say, good job. I'm so proud of you. You did, you did something right. And I'm like, yes. So I knew something about granola. I had knowledge about it. I knew that it tasted good to me. And I also knew that there was going to be some outcomes of granola that I was going to like. So I knew some things, and then I liked those things, and then I did some things. Does that make sense? I knew some things about granola, then I loved those things about granola, then I did some things about granola. And that's how, that's how our lives work. Now, granola might not seem like a significant decision to you unless you have digestive struggles, but um, it is an important thing to think about why we do the things that we do in our life. And I just want to boil it down to you. We do things. This is the reason you do what you do. You know things. You understand things. You believe things in your mind. And what happens in your mind transforms what goes on in your heart. It changes what you love. And what you love and what you do affects, or what you love affects what you do. Does that make sense? Your mind affects what you love, which affects what you do. Yeah, let's do it. Your mind affects what you love, which affects what you do. So those are the three steps of how people ultimately change. Your mind changes your heart, which changes your will. And that's how things go. Um, and if you ever want to change anything, um, want to stop biting your fingernails, get better at playing the piano, own a Waffle House franchise, um, or become more like Jesus, this is how it goes down. Your mind changes your heart, which changes your will. And we're going to get into that more this week, but I really want to give you a tangible example that's a little something a little bit more than granola. So, I have allergies. I have terrible allergies. I moved a few years ago from Virginia, where I had bad allergies, to South Carolina, where I had devastating allergies where when the first five months I lived there, I think I had six sinus infections. And um, like what was living in here was amazing. Like Area 51 wanted to get up there and find out what, where did these colors come from? And so I needed to find out how does a person live their life in South Carolina? Because it turns out there's millions of people who do it. How do they do it? How do they live? And it turns out most people don't have terrible allergies, but some people do. And so I went to the doctor, he gave me nose sprays, and he gave me pills, and he told me I should actually have a surgery, and blah, 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 but I'm impoverished. Just kidding, parents, don't send me money. But, um, but uh, we, we didn't have the means to make all that stuff happen, but the one thing that really happened that was helpful was I was introduced to this beautiful device. Any of you ever seen one of these before? Yeah. It's so good. Oh, wait, yes. Wait, stick it up and I'll show you. Yes. Yes, those are so good. It's so pleasant. So what, what you do with this is you, you stick it up your nose. And then the water, it's not just water. It's like a certain solution of salty with the right, like, 
H something balance, blah, 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 the smart people know about. And you spray it up your nose and it goes up in here and it collects all that good stuff that people don't want because it's not actually good stuff. We just call it good stuff because we want to feel better. So it, and then it comes out the other side. You blow your nose and it's beautiful. Um, yep. And actually, it, it feels really weird. The first time I did it, I felt like I was um, drowning or surfing accident, I imagine, because I did go surfing once or I tried to, but I never stood up, nor did I actually get anywhere, so I don't think it actually counts as surfing. It was like <laughs> swimming with an uncomfortable board. But either way, what happened in my sinuses wasn't great. I'm, I'm going to demonstrate this to you guys um, because I, I want you to know um, with some clarity what I'm talking about. So every day, every day, two times per day, every morning, every night, at least, I take one of these and I do this. Oh, wait, I'm going to protect the microphone. And then... I do this. <laughs> and then I do this. <laughs> then I do this. <laughs> and then I take it on. No, it's a process, and I do the other side too. Um, but. Why? It's it it's very important to me, and I'll tell you exactly why. It's it's sort of gross, and I really don't love it. It's salty. It's weird. It makes me have to like buy tissues like I got stock in this and um, it it's really annoying but I love it so much now you know why I love it because I know that if I do this my sinuses will be clear and I'll feel good and I love feeling good because I can be here I can hang out with you we can write good songs at breakfast time oh, yeah. we can goof around um, we can talk about Jesus we can love each other grow together all that stuff is good so I know that this bottle lets me experience shaky, so I love it. I love it. Try and take this bottle from me, I will kill you. No, I'm, um, I love it. So I then, every day, I take the bottle and I use it. What I know about the bottle affects how I live because I, I love this bottle because of what I know it, it provides for me. And so I take the time to actually live it out. My knowledge affects what I love and what I love affects what I do. So every morning, every night, I do that to my nose. And it is sort of gross. Tastes weird. But I really like to not have a sinus infection. And so I do it. And that might sound ridiculous to you guys, but... What, what we know changes what we love, which changes what we do. And that's just the way things are. Now, I'm just going to quote for you guys real quick as we get close to wrapping this up. Very famous verse. So, did you guys know that when the Bible was written, there actually weren't like chapter and verse numbers in there? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, so, excuse me. So, when the Bible was first written, it was actually just written. And there's a very famous passage at the end, or at the beginning of Romans chapter 12, but when it was first written, it was just called Romans kind of close to the end. Um, does that make sense to you guys? Because there was no chapter 12. And what comes before chapter 12? Chapter yeah, chapter 11, which back then was called Romans not quite as close to the end. And so... Um, at the end of Romans 11, Paul is writing and he just says these amazing things about God. He talks about how no one is like God, how God is, is, doesn't need advice from anyone. He can do whatever he wants. He's unstoppable. He deserves all the glory forever and ever. And it's all good. And then Romans 12 begins and it says, Therefore, because that's what God is like, because of his greatness and his mercy, um, we should give ourselves to God. And then verse 12 says this, do not conform to the pattern of this world. So he says, God is awesome, therefore we should remember what God has done for us and then live in a certain way. Don't conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Now that's a very popular and famous verse. And what I think a lot of people think it means is I need to work really hard to not conform to the world. But that's not what it says. It says, 
do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed. Does it say transform yourself? No, it says that you should be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That what changes us is the changing of our mind. And the outcome of that is we can know God's perfect and pleasing will for us. So God changes us, He transforms us, our whole person, our whole being, by changing our minds. That's where it all starts. And we don't have to do the things that the world does because we don't have to love what the world loves because we understand what the world doesn't understand. Does that make sense to you? And so we're actually able to have our minds renewed so that we can be transformed, so that we can know what God's will is, so that we can do it, and His will is perfect. That's really awesome. I want to live a life that God says, man, that's like according to, that, that life looks really perfect. We can't do that on our own, but if it's the life that God has designed, is it perfect? Does God make any designs that aren't perfect? No. Does God have any plans that aren't perfect? No. Does God include you in His plan? Yes. Yes. So how does He want you to be? Now this is where it's hard because the Bible says things like, be holy like God is holy. And we think, oh, I can't do that. And you're right, we, you can't, I can't. No one can do that. But God can change us into who He's already said that we are. This is the best part of the whole story is that God is the one who saves us, right? Jesus' work on the cross, His death, His resurrection, His perfect life, those things give us salvation. But God is also the one who transforms us. That He doesn't just say, okay, I've saved you, the rest is up to you. He actually makes you like Him. And the way that He does this is by saying, I have adopted you into my family. You're my son now. I care about you. I know the end result where you're going to be holy and righteous and perfect and with me. And I'm going to accomplish that in you. And I love this truth because it means that I already am a son of God. And Jesus is going to make me live that way. He's going to make me into who I already am. And the way he does that is by transforming my mind. One final example on this is maybe like a caterpillar. When you look at a caterpillar, what do you see? It's like a little fuzzy worm. And um, he might look nice and pleasant, um, but we know that one day, if everything goes correctly, he will or she will become a butterfly. True? Now, what is amazing, science nerds, is that the DNA for the caterpillar and the butterfly are the same. Is a caterpillar the same thing as a butterfly? No. This is really fascinating. A caterpillar and a butterfly in some ways are different, but their DNA, who they really are, their coded level of existence says they're the same. And when a caterpillar becomes a butterfly, the caterpillar is becoming what it was always meant to be and what its DNA said it always was. And when you become more like Jesus, God is transforming you to become into who he says you are. He's transforming you to become who he plans for you to be, who he has designed for you to be, and who you really are. And that's good news for us, that each one of us might feel like a, a worm right now. You might feel like a little caterpillar, and it's no fun, no good, everything's terrible. You know, all the other piano players are better than you. You're going to be the 47th violin and the 39th flute, and you're like, I'm not, I'm not good. And you're like, everyone else seems to have their life together, and that somehow they all look nice, and here I am, more nerdy than everybody else, or, um, you know without as cool of a beard as Kelly, and <laughs> woe is me. But the truth is that who you are and who a, who a caterpillar is in the eyes of God is something amazing, and that God will work and God will transform you. And this whole week, the rest of the week, we're going to work on this. How do we actually live into the truth that God transforms you into who you were always meant to be by changing your mind, which changes your heart, which changes your will. Let's do our little hand motions. Changing our mind changes our heart, which changes our will. That was so good. All right, let me pray for us. God, I pray for these students, for the counselors, for the faculty, and for myself that we would recognize the truth that you are great, that you are awesome, and that you are for us. We ask that you would help us to love the gospel because you have made us 
you have made us your family. And we thank you that the end is not in question because you will make us like you. And I pray that the rest of this week as we spend time together, we would really dig into the truth that because you love us, because you're for us, and because you're powerful, you will transform our minds, which will change what we love, which will change what we do, which will show your, your glory to the whole world so that people will see who you are. And we pray this together in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, guys.